put the dark energy, and the title is Structure Formation and Observational Tests. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so this is the third lecture, so I changed gear. So in the last two lectures, I talk, uh, talked about the theoretical models and why it's important to think about dark energy and how difficult it is to construct theoretical models. So today, so I will look at dark energy uh, f from a slightly different angle, so try to understand how we test dark energy models using observations. So in order to do that, I want to specify uh, my model. So basically, I want to uh, have a gravitational equation. So this is the Einstein equations. Uh, this T mu nu m is the energy momentum tensor for the normal matter, including baryons and cold dark matter. But then I introduced this new tensor, E mu nu. This can be either dark energy or the modification of gravity. Okay, so this E mu nu describes the modification of gravity in the left-hand side or the new matter in the right-hand side. But I said that you can combine the two and we want to know how we can distinguish between these two possibilities. The only requirement for this tensor is that due to the Bianchi identity, the total of the energy momentum tensor of the matter and this new tensor should be conserved. So this is the only condition. And in the background, due to this homogeneity and isotropy, I can write down this immune tensor as a diagonal metric, and you have energy density and pressure. So if you consider dark energy, this is the energy density of dark energy, and these are the pressure of the dark energy. And as I said, that the only thing you have to know is the equation of state. So this is the ratio between pressure and density. But this may come from modified gravity, but you can still define an effective tensor. Maybe this is not energy, but this is uh, related to the modification of gravity, but what you have to know is just an equation of state. Okay? So now, using that just background equation, uh, you can only prove the equation of state, so we want to go beyond that. To do that, we want to consider structure formation. To describe structure formation, I will consider small deviations from Friedman metric described by these two functions, psi and phi. So now this depends on time and space. And I will assume these two functions are small, so you can basically expand Einstein equations up to first order and try to find the solutions for these small perturbations. So I will use conformal time, eta, so the, this is the conformal Hubble parameter. So this prime is the conformal time derivative. So in center of cosmic time, I will use conformal time. So technical term, I will consider linear scalar perturbations with respect to this three-dimensional space. And I assume three space is flat uh, for the moment. Okay? And maybe you hear about this cosmological perturbation theory. So in order to deal with these small perturbations, you have to understand this cosmological perturbation theory. And there are very nice uh, reviews, and I recommend to look at uh, these reviews. But just say that the only important thing in my uh, lecture is that remember that I will use the Fourier transformation. So I will expand all the scalar function in terms of uh, exponential ikx, okay? So k is a wave number. So k large means that you are considering a very small scales, and small k means that you are considering large scales, okay? And we want to construct the index, and I try this. Uh... Okay, so then, uh, we, we want to include the index uh, SI, so this is a vector, but I only want to use scalar. So this vector is defined as a derivative. Okay, so this is basically the spatial derivative of the uh, scalar function. I can construct also three-dimensional metrics, and I decompose this into trace part proportional to delta ij, and the traceless part, Sij, so trace of Sij is zero, 
And this trace is three-dimensional trace. So I is X, Y, and Z. Okay? So I can decompose any three-dimensional tensor into two scalars, trace part and trace list part. Okay? And then the fourth point of this cosmological perturbation theory is that in GR, GR is the theory where you can change coordinate and does not change uh, your physics. So this means that for linear perturbations, there is a symmetry. So you change your coordinate and you shift the coordinate, the theory is invariant. And you should care about this. And I do not uh, discuss this uh, in details. Basically, having this form of the metric, I already chose a gauge, so I already fixed my coordinate. Okay. So this is I can do always for any theory of gravity. Yeah. That's right, Poisson gauge. Yeah. You can use any gauge. Newtonian gauge is the easiest gauge to use to understand the structure formation. But as I said, I can use any gauge. It's just a convenience. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a linear uh, transformation. So this is a small trans, uh, transformation. And this xi mu contains all the information. So I will decompose this xi mu into scalar, vector, tensor. And I only consider scalar transformations. I'll maybe discuss it later. OK. So by doing that, um, so everything now expanded by Fourier transformation. I can decompose vector and tensor. So let's look at the energy momentum tensor. So this part is the same as background. You have density and you have density perturbations. You have pressure and pressure perturbations. So that's the same. So now you have two additional quantities, V. So this is the velocity. As I said, I will define this SI. This is just a derivative of scalar function. So this scalar function, V, is velocity. Okay? So this is the new quantities. Uh, new quantity appears in the perturbations. Then you can have this traceless part of pressure. So in the background, by symmetry, you can have only the part proportional to delta ij. But now you can have this traceless part. And this is the uh, anisotropic stress. So for perturbations, you have two new quantities, velocity and anisotropic stress. So now, for the moment, I would assume that energy momentum tensor is conserved for matter. So I would assume for the moment there is a conservation of energy momentum tensor. So I will come back to this because remember that what we need was the sum of this T mu nu and the new tensor E mu nu is conserved. But for the moment, I would assume that the matter energy momentum tensor is conserved. So using this conservation equation, you get the equations for the density perturbation. So this is the energy conservation equation. And so this is the Euler equation. So this is the equation for velocity. So remember, in the background, you only have one equation. But for perturbations, now you have two equations. So the continuity equation and the Euler equation. And you have anisotropic stress and pressure perturbations. Okay? So these are the equations uh, that determines the evolution of uh, matter quantities. As before, you have to specify the equation of state. So for the background, I say the matter has no pressure. So equation of state is zero. And in fact, matter does not have any pressure and anisotropic stress. So the cold dark matter has no pressure on uh, uh, anisotropic stress, so these are zero. But this new tensor, you have to specify equation of state, but in addition, you have to specify pressure perturbations and anisotropic stress. So these are new parameters you have if you consider linear perturbations. OK? So now you want to use the Einstein equations. The Einstein equations uh, give these two equations. So phi and psi, remember, these are the functions in the metric. 
So this is geometry. It's determined by matter. So I define a new density, so the combination of density perturbation and velocity perturbation, but basically this is the density perturbations. So you have a contribution from matter, and you have a contribution from this new tensor, either dark energy or modified gravity. Okay? So this is the Parsons equation. So this determines the three-dimensional curvature uh, in terms of the density perturbations. So in addition, you have this new equation. So this is the relation between psi and phi. Remember, psi is the time-time component of the metric. Phi is the space-space component of the metric. This is related by the anisotropic stress. So if there is no anisotropic stress, there is a very important relation between these two functions. So if anisotropic stress is zero, uh, you have the relation that phi equals psi. So this is the prediction of GR if there is no anisotropic stress. But uh, dark energy or modified gravity can introduce anisotropic stress and you change the relation. Okay, so these are the two equations you can use. So combination of these two equations with conservation of energy momentum tensor gives the evolution of all these quantities, phi, psi, density perturbations, and velocities. Okay? So let's look at the conservation of energy momentum tensor for matter, and I consider a small scale. Small means that the uh, k is larger than h, and if that's this conformal h is related to the usual Hubble parameter as the scale factor times Hubble parameter, so this ratio between k and h is k over a h. And k over a is the physical wavelength inverse. So you are comparing the wavelengths of perturbations against the Hubble horizon. So this condition means that you are considering the perturbations whose wavelengths are smaller than horizon scales. So we are interested in small scales. So using these conditions, the matter evolution equations are very simple. So the, this is the uh, continuity equation. And this is the velocity, but I defined a new velocity. It's just the uh, k over h times v. So this is known as the velocity divergence. And this is, uh, in fact, uh, related to, if you go back to the original definition, so this is the spatial derivative of the velocity, so that's the reason why it is called divergence. So, but basically, this is the velocity. And then you get the equations for velocity. And this is the Newtonian potential. So remember, psi is the time-time component. So this is the Newtonian potential. And then combining these two equations, you get a very important equation. So this de uh, determines the evolution of this small uh, inhomogeneity in dark matter. It's determined by the Newton potential. Okay. Yeah, so the question is the, uh, how we can separate tensor perturbations from the scalar perturbations. So again, coming back to the cosmological perturbation theory, there is a theorem that says that if you decompose perturbations into scalar vector tensor, uh, they do not mix at linear order. But if we go to nonlinear order, they will mix. But I consider a small perturbations, so at linear order, they will not mix. It doesn't mean that you can ignore a tensor. You have to consider, but it does not change the scale of it. Okay? So this means that, in fact, the evolution of dark matter density is very simple. You just need to know the Newton potential. So I didn't use any gravitational theory so far. The only assumption is this, conservation of energy momentum tensor and the small scales. So all of what we need to know is the potential and then you have to use the Einstein equations. Okay. So how about the, uh, this new component E? So you have to have the equations for this new component. So you have density perturbations. And again, you have Euler equations to determine the velocity. 
But this new component had four new quantities, so density perturbations, pressure perturbations, anastopic stress, and velocity. But you have only two equations. So this is similar to the background. You have to specify equation of state in the same way you have to specify pressure perturbation and anastopic stress. So this you cannot uh, get from the equations, so this conservation of energy momentum tensor. So you have to specify this, so this is basically the same as equation of state in the background. Eta is conformal time, conformal time. Yeah, so eta is conformal time, H is the conformal half loop. So for pressure perturbations, maybe you heard about sound speed. We often use sound speed to define pressure perturbations. The sound speed is defined as the ratio between pressure perturbations and density perturbations when velocity is zero. So in the frame where you are moving with fluid, if you take the ratio between pressure perturbation and density perturbation, uh, we call this sound speed. And this sound speed in the general frame where the fluid is moving uh, is written by this. And this GA is the adiabatic sound speed. So this is very similar, but constructed using the background quantity. So this P pressure is a background pressure. Rho is the background density, and the prime is the conformal time derivative. So you can calculate this. And in fact, this is written just in terms of the equation of the state. But this sound speed is not determined by adiabatic sound speed. And in fact, you can have any sound speed depending on what kind of fluid you have. Okay. So you have to specify this sound speed. Yep. So this case, uh, this WE. Yep. So this is a general uh, formula which can be applied to uh, any component. So if you consider E component, it must be E. OK? Yep. Oh, yeah, so I do the Fourier transformation. So this was originally a function of time and space. But space time, I do the Fourier transformation. That's the reason why I have k. So this is a function of k and the eta. However, for each k, this is the usual derivative. OK? OK, so let's look at the uh, several cases. I will classify the evolution of this dark matter density according to the different models. The simplest case, of course, is lambda CDM. In this case, this E mu tensor is just minus lambda times G mu nu. Then the Einstein equations are very simple. So this is the Poisson equation. And as I said, you have this com uh, condition between phi and psi. So this means that you can change psi to phi. So remember, I had psi here. And so you want to find psi. So psi is the same as phi. And phi can be related to delta. And you get these equations for delta. So this is just an equation for delta. So density perturbations, so you can solve it. Okay. So this just uh, means a very simple equation. This is the gravity. So the gravity of dark matter uh, basically makes the density growth. And this is a friction term, uh, which we already saw in the scalar field example. And this friction is coming from the expansion of the universe. And the simple case is the matter-dominated data. So forget about lambda. In very early universe, you can forget about lambda. So the scale factor, in terms of conformal time, scales like eta squared. And you can calculate the, uh, this uh, density uh, in terms of the conformal Hubble parameter. And this you can calculate from scale factor. And substituting all this, you can solve this equation. And you find that this sort of, uh, equation has a solution where the solution grows like scale factor. So D plus, so because this is a second order equation, you have two solutions, one growing, one decaying. But we are interested in the late time solution, so I will choose growing model solutions, D plus. So in the matter-dominated era, dark matter density grows as scale factor. OK? 
Okay, so that's the important uh, result of this equation. So where is the effect of lambda? So effect of lambda indeed happens only here because the conformal Hubble a parameter is related to the density of matter and lambda. So at late times, lambda becomes important and the expansion of the universe becomes uh, faster and faster and the friction time wins over gravity. And what happens is that if you normalize this growth function by scale factor, in matter-dominated universe, it's always one. But due to this lambda, expansion becomes fast and the structure grows, uh, basically slows down. So in terms of D plus over A, this is lambda CDM prediction. So you see the suppression of growth. So this makes sense, right? So if you have lambda, expansion becomes faster and faster, and the structure does not grow as fast as you imagine. Okay? So this suppression is the evidence of lambda. Okay? So let's consider a general dark energy model. So now we want to extend this to the general models. So let's consider a dark energy model. In the background, you can have any equation of state. However, in this case, I only consider a very smooth dark energy. So dark energy does not have any perturbations. So this means that the density and anisotropic stress, sorry, this is a capital pi, is zero. So there is no perturbation of dark energy. So in this case, in fact, you get exactly the same equations for delta. Because if there is no uh, density perturbations from dark energy and there is no anisotropic stress, basically Einstein equations are the same. Okay, so it doesn't affect any uh, gravitational equations. So you get exactly the same equations. So the effect of lambda, no, dark energy, is included in this, again, the Hubble expansion. And this is a very good exercise. So you can write down this equation and the background equation using this n. So n is a logarithmic of a scale factor. So this dot is the derivative with respect to n. And you can derive this equation. So this takes the growing solution. And you can derive this equation from this. And this is coming from just the background equation. And you, yeah. A conformal time derivative. And I change conformal time derivative to n derivative. So dot is n derivative. Oh, so lambda has no perturbations. So there is no perturbations by definition. For dark energy, you have to consider perturbations. Here, I neglect the perturbations. OK, so then look at this d plus over a. As I said, if there is no lambda, you should be just 1. This is lambda CDM. Now you can change the equation of state. So this is one parameterization. So w0 is constant, wa is constant. But this part is describing the time dependent of w. And so w0 can be different from minus 1. And you can solve these equations, and you can derive this growth rate. And we have, uh, I have three cases. So this blue line is W0 is minus 0 0.8, and there is no time dependence. So this is constant equation of state. And this is W0 minus 0.8, but WA is minus 0.3. This is W0 minus 0.8, WA is plus 0.3. Yeah. That's a very good question, yeah. Is it consistent to neglect perturbations? I will come back to this. So assumption is that because we are considering very small scales, small scales, you can ignore our perturbations. That's the assumption, but I will come back to this. OK, so then you notice that so this is a lambda CDM. And if W is larger than minus 1, you get more suppression. And this depends on the normalization in this figure. I fixed the present state dark energy energy density. Okay? So if equation of state is larger than minus 1, dark energy density changes. And in fact, dark energy density is larger in the past compared with lambda CDM. That's the reason why you get more suppressions. Okay? However, you see that 
due to this parameterization, if W0 is minus 0 0.8 and WA is minus 0 0.3, effectively, it's very similar to minus 1. So there, there is a degeneracy between lambda CDM and dark energy. Okay. So this will show up later if we consider observational constraint. And another interesting quantity you often see is the growth rate. So the definition is the logarithmic derivative of this density, uh, logarithmic uh, of uh, scale factor. And this is basically the derivative of scale factor in terms of A, and you multiply A over D. And this basically measures how fast the uh, delta is changing. And again, this is a very good exercise. You can also derive the equations for this F growth rate. Because this is already fast derivative, you get the first uh, derivative equations. And again, you can solve this very easily. Dot is again derivative with, with respect to log A. And again, if you specify W, you can solve this and find F. And there is a very interesting prediction for this gloss light in dark energy model with no perturbation of dark energy. This gamma uh, is defined like F is proportional to omega matter to gamma. If you define F in this way, gamma is 0 0.545 for lambda CDM. And there is a very little dependence on equation of state. So if W is very close to minus 1, gamma is always this number. So this is a very interesting prediction of the smooth dark energy. But remember that this doesn't mean that the F itself does not depend on the equation of state. So you, there are a lot of examples with different parameters. And clearly, you see that the F itself depends on the equation of state. That's just because omega m depends on the equation of state. But if, if you can measure gamma, this is a very robust prediction of lambda CDM and smooth dark energy. So that's the reason why you often see this gamma for example, in the Euclid mission statement, because this gamma is an indication uh, for the uh, non-lambda CDM physics. OK? So let's move on to more complicated uh, scenarios. So there was a question. So can we really neglect the perturbation of dark energy? So that's the question. So let's consider the model where I have the density of dark energy, but still let's assume there is no pressure anisotropic stress. So I assume there is no anisotropic stress, so I only consider the density perturbations. So how we get this clustering dark energy? So in order to understand that, let's consider a very simple example where you have some pressure perturbations. So pressure perturbation of this fluid is proportional to the density perturbation, and this is the sound speed. And assume that this fluid dominates the universe, and you repeat the same calculation as before, and you get the equations for this density. So this is the same equation you saw for dark matter if there is no pressure. Okay? But if there is a pressure, you have this additional term determined by the sound speed. For dark matter, we say that there is no pressure perturbation, so there is no term like this. So then you get the uh, previous equation. But if there is a pressure, then you get this equation. So what's this term does? So this is basically coming from pressure, and this is gravity. So basically, you are, are looking at the situation that you have some inhomogeneity. And if you have a gravity, basically gravity want to collapse, but there is a pressure, then this pressure want to support this system. So this is a comparison between pressure and gravity, and there is a wavelength determined by this combination, and determined by the sound speed. And if we consider very large K, uh, basically pressure wins over gravity, and density does not grow. So I assume this must be positive. If it is negative, it becomes unstable. Yeah. 
Uh, you can see from this, because if this is negative, you get an exponential function and it grows. So this means that in order to have clustering of dark energy, the sound speed of dark energy must be small. Okay, that's the condition. So let's look at the quintessence model. So we looked at the scalar field example of dark energy. So how this fit in? So if we compute the sound speed of the scalar field, so this is a definition. So at, uh, in the last frame of the scalar field, the velocity is zero, sound speed is one. Okay, so this means that the scalar field is very different from dark matter. It has a pressure. So sound speed is one. And you can also compute the equation motion for the scalar field, and you find that a similar gradient term, so this k square term, oh, this works. So this k square term, so in the scalar field equation, you have this term, and this is one for scalar field if the scalar field is described by this Lagrangian. So this is the quintessence model. So this means that the scalar field with this Lagrangian has a, a sound speed very large, larger than zero. So this means that the scalar field does not cluster in, on the small scales. So that's the reason why quintessence can be regarded as a smooth dark energy on small scales. So you can ignore the perturbation of the scalar field. So this is an example of the smooth dark energy. Uh, however, there was a very nice question. Is it, it is indeed uh, in consistent to ignore scalar field perturbations? And the answer is no. And this is a very good example. So this is a CMB power spectrum. So this is a CMB power spectrum, temperature power spectrum. This is a multiple. So this is a small scales. This is large scales. So you have two cases. Equation of state is minus one third. So it's a very extreme case. And this is the case when you ignore the scalar field perturbations by hand. And then you get this huge effect. But then if you include the scalar field perturbations, this is your answer. So this means that you overestimate the difference from lambda CDM if you ignore the perturbation of scalar field by hand. So this means that you, yeah, the question. No, I think so this, this is in, in fact inconsistent. So if you start from Lagrangian, you have to include perturbation of scalar field. But by hand, you can set this perturbation zero. It's not consistent, but you can do that. Then you get a very wrong answer. However, you get the same answer on small scales. This is what I'm saying. If you go to small scales, you can ignore the scalar field perturbations. So on small scales, you can think this is a smooth dark energy. But remember that this is not always the case. On horizon scales, near horizon scales, you have to worry about perturbations. So how we get this small sound speed if you want to have clustering of dark energy? So there is an example, again, using scalar fields. The action is like this. So instead of having this kinetic term, you can have any function of this kinetic term. And then you compute the sound speed. And sound speed depends on this function, k. And if you, k is a linear function, this is a standard quintessence, then there is no second derivative. So this comma x is a derivative with respect to x. So this is 0, and the sound speed is 1. But if there is a second derivative, you see that you can have small sound speed. So this is an example where you can have a small sound speed for scalar field. And if you have this kind of model, scalar field can cluster. Even you can make the situation that the sound speed of the scalar field is very close to zero. So it behaves like dark matter, even if it looks like dark energy in the background. So this is the uh, example of the clustering uh, dark energy. So let's look at the effect on the growth uh, on this uh, uh, from this uh, clustering of dark energy. Yeah. Sorry, can you say that again? Ghost. Uh, so this has no ghost because there is a condition, but um, if you choose K properly, 
there is no ghost in this Lagrange. So remember, I choose the correct sign here. So I'm not changing the sign. So this must be, uh, so in the natural unit, there is no dimension. Any other questions? Sorry, sorry, I can't do that. Yeah, it is just a scalar field theory, and you can write on any, you know, Lagrangian, and you say this is just a function of kinetic term you can do. So where this comes from, that's a different question. But as a Lagrangian for scalar field, you can write down this. Okay? So going back to the effect on the growth, so now the Einstein equations uh, become this. So this is the Poisson equation. So now you have the uh, clustering of dark energy. So you have a contribution from dark energy clustering. But I assume that there is no anisotropic stress. So phi is still the same as psi. So this is the condition for this class of model. So this means that, indeed, the clustering of dark energy is like modified gravity. Because for dark matter, this is basically effective Newton constant. So you are changing gravity for dark matter because there is some unknown matter dark energy which clusters and they make gravity. So this changes the gravity for dark matter, so it looks like uh, modified gravity. But this can be modified gravity, or this can be just you have a dark energy which clusters. Okay. So this is the point. So the cluster and the dark energy uh, looks like modification of gravity. But the one assumption I used is the anisotropic stress. So remember that this relation between phi and psi, uh, so this relation um, is proportional to the anisotropic stress. And I assume that this dark energy does not have any anisotropic stress. And this is usually the case. For example, scalar fields does not have any anisotropic stress. So for quintessence or k-essence, you do not have the anisotropic stress. So this is zero. For the scalar field, psi is the same as phi. And for the normal matter like radiation, so radiation has anisotropic stress. However, the anisotropic stress usually is smaller than density perturbations. And of course, it's very uneasy to talk about normal matter for dark energy because we don't know what is dark energy. And dark energy can have large anisotropic stress. But non, all the known matter has a very small anisotropic stress, small compared to density. So, there is a reason to assume that the anisotropic stress is smaller than density. But this, at the moment, this is the assumption. Okay? So finally, let's look at the case when the anisotropic stress is non-negligible. And this is the case of modified gravity. So let's consider the brown sticky gravity I showed. And in fact, the uh, simplest example is the F of R gravity. This is equivalent to this theory. So there is no kinetic term, but the scalar field couples to the rich curvature. And in this case, this is a very special case of brown stick gravity where brown stick parameter is zero. And then you can consider a small perturbation of a scalar field. So at the leading order, this is just a gravitational constant, but you can consider small perturbations. And in the last lecture, I said that this small perturbation of scalar field couples to matter and changes gravity. And in fact, in the Poisson equation, you get the contribution from this perturbation of scalar field, and this mediates the additional force. Okay. So this looks like just a clustering dark energy. If you compare this clustering dark energy case, you can identify that the clustering of dark energy is coming from this additional scalar field.
Sorry, can you repeat it again? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we consider a linear perturbations at the moment. And in fact, f of, gra f of our gravity, uh, this parameter is always zero. And the solar system constraint is uh, evaded by the potential. I didn't write it down. But for linear perturbations, you can linearize the potential. OK, so um, but the new thing is this anisotropic stress. And if you derive the uh, equations from this Lagrangian, you get a contributions from the scalar field perturbations to this equation. So now the relation between phi and psi is modified, and this is determined by these scalar field perturbations. Oh, vector field. As I said, that I do the scalar vector tensor decomposition. And for this linear order, uh, vector is decoupled from scalar. So you can just think about scalar. Of course, there is a vector perturbation, but you can think this separately. So what is the question? Ah, comment, okay, thank you. Yeah. Question, yeah. Yeah. In the Einstein frame, in fact, anisotropic stress disappears. But the effect appears in a different way. So I will show this is the second, uh, next class. OK, so let's look at the examples. As I said, that f of our gravity is the basically brown sticky gravity with uh, brown sticky parameter 0. But the difference is that you have potential in addition to this. And if you linearize it, you have this mass term. So this is the equation for phi. So this is, these are the Einstein equations, and you need the equations for phi. And in this theory, equations for phi is given by this. And so phi is sourced by delta. So sorry, this is uh, uh, this delta. But in addition, there is a mass term depending on this function. Okay. So now you solve this equation, substitute into this, and then you can find the evolution of dark matter density perturbations. And this is all determined by these equations for Newton potential. So it's a bit complicated, so let's look at it. The solutions for the Newton potential in this theory looks like this. So this part, ho pi g times this one, uh, looks the same as lambda CDM. But then due to this mass term, you get these corrections. So there are two cases. So again, this mass term, so as I said, the inverse of this mass is the Compton wavelength. So if we consider large scales, larger than Compton wavelengths, so large scales means that the k is small. So this term becomes large. This term becomes large. So then taking the ratio, you see that this uh, ratio is 1. So you go back to GR. So on large scales, in this theory, you go back to GR. This is because this scalar field uh, has a mass. So it doesn't propagate beyond this Compton wavelength. So this scalar disappears, and you go back to GR. But if you go to small scales, k becomes large. So this term becomes small, this term becomes small. And then you notice that the gravitational constant becomes 4 third times g. So gravity is stronger in this theory. So in fact, this is a picture. So inside this Compton wavelength, gravity is stronger. Okay? So this is due to this additional force you have in this theory. So this is the problem I mentioned last time. So if you modify gravity, you have this additional force. And this mass is indeed uh, of the order Hubble scale. So this scale is a cosmological scale. And inside of which, you have a Hughes force, and you get a stronger gravity. So having these person equations, the evolution of this uh, growth function becomes very complicated. Now it depends on k. So it depends on the scale you are looking at. So this is the case of lambda CDM. So lambda CDM has this behavior. So due to the lambda, the structure growth is suppressed. 
So this is a two-dimensional figure of showing this. So this is the shift. So this is today. So this is today. And you start from constant, and then it decays. But this doesn't depend on the k, so wave number. But in this gravity model, you get exactly the same behavior on large scales for small k. So you look at this. This looks like lambda CDM. And in fact, for small k, the growth rate behaves like lambda CDM. But if you go to small scales, you have an enhancement of gravity so that you get the enhancement of the growth. So in this model, the structure is more enhanced on small scales, and you get a huge increase of your structure. So if you look at this k mode, so for small k, this is larger than 1. So this means that, in fact, structure is more, uh, structure growth is more uh, pronounced compared with uh, even the matter-dominated universe. So this is due to the stronger gravity. But you see that once you have this complicated modified gravity, then even the growth rate becomes very complicated. And you notice that then you have to have screening mechanism because on small scales, your gravity is completely different from GR. So you have to have screening mechanism to recover solar system control. So finally, this is the final class. So I said that the only condition I had is that the combination of these two tensors uh, is conserved. But you can have the situation that, in fact, you can have an energy exchange between dark matter and this new field. And this is known as the interacting dark energy model. So if you say E comes from dark energy, M is dark matter, so dark matter and dark energy is interacting. And in fact, this is nothing but the Einstein frame version of the same theory I talked about. So in the Brunswick theory, can be written in this way. So now this becomes the Einstein gravity. So it's the same as Einstein theory, but now you have an interaction between this scalar field and dark matter. And this, if, if this scalar field is the dark energy, you got the interactions. And this, you have to specify this energy exchange and in this example, in energy exchange is determined by the scalar field and this alpha, so the coupling strength. So how this changes the structure formation? You don't change Einstein equations because equa uh, gravity is Einstein. But now you change the evolution equations for matter because now you change this equation. In this example, you don't change the continuity equation, but you change the Euler equation. And if you look at the collections, you see that this perturbation of the scalar field appears here. And in fact, this is similar to modified gravity because now you are changing the Newtonian potential, but this is coming from the coupling. And in addition, you have a different friction term coming from the coupling. Okay, so, but in this case, remember that the matter is coupled to this scalar field. So again, you have to worry about the local uh, constraint. And in this case, as I said, you can evade this constraint by assuming that this coupling happens only to dark matter, not to baryons. Okay. So this is the summary of all the models. Um, so we start from lambda CDM, smooth dark energy, so this model is characterized only by the equation of state. You can have a KS sense type model where you have a clustering of dark energy, but no anisotropic stress. Modified gravity is an example of where you have clustering of dark energy and anisotropic stress. And you can have an interacting dark energy, so in this case you have to specify these interactions. So all of these models have a different impact on the structure formation. So the question is how to distinguish between these models, okay? Um, so I think I started from... Okay, so any questions so far? Okay. Okay, so let's look at the so what kind of observations we can use. 
So you will have uh, very nice lectures on large scale structure and CMB next week. So uh, it is not my intention to review all the observations. Uh, my aim here is to again make the assumption very clear. So what kind of assumption you are using to measure these things. And sometimes if you look at the formula, sometimes GR is uh, used in a hidden way. So I don't want to do that. So I try to make sure what is the assumption to do these observations. So the background I don't need to repeat. So we have supernovae and baryon acoustic oscillations. And what this is doing is to measure this background expansion history. So I do not repeat. So you can do this background observations. So for the structure formation, what we can do? So one option is to measure the weak lensing. Okay. So the lensing is the phenomena that you have a mass. The trajectory of the photon is bent due to this mass distribution. So here, the assumption is I can use this metric, so small perturbation from Friedman universe, but I do not use any gravitational theory, so this is just a geometrical uh, assumption. The assumption is that photons follow geodesics of this uh, metric. And then you can com uh, calculate so-called convergence, uh, convergence, which basically measures how the light is bent by the structure between the source and the observer. And this is a bit complicated formula, so let's uh, look at it separately. So this first term, so chi is a commoving distance. Okay. So chi s is the distance between us to the source. So this is the distance between us to the source. Chi is the uh, distance to the lens. So this is the dark matter distribution at chi. And chi is the distance between uh, this lens to us. Okay. So this is a geometrical factor which comes from the formula for the lensing. And what determines lensing is this combination, phi plus psi over half. Okay. So basically, if you have this lensing potential, this is phi plus psi half here, this lensing potential changes your trajectory of photons, and this changes your image at your, at your observer position. And this is a two-dimensional derivative along this plane. The important thing to remember is that this is uh, measuring this combination phi plus psi. And then this convergence uh, is related to the shear, and this shear creates the difference of the shapes of galaxies that we can measure. So of course, there are a long story from here to here, but from a theoretical point of view, the important thing is that lensing is determined by this combination of fiber psi. Here, I do not use any gravitational theory. So CMB, so CMB is a background observations, but there are two uh, things you can measure which is sensitive to the structure formation. So one is known as the integrated sucks wolf effect, so this is again related to this lensing potential. So if you have a lensing potential and this changes with time, so eta is a conformal time, due to this change of the potential, CMB photon temperature is changed. And this is determined by the time derivative of this lensing potential. Okay. So this is another way to measure this combination. But in this case, this is determined by the time derivative. Also, the CMB photon is lensed in the same way, so you get exactly the same formula, but of course the source is CMB, so LSS is the last scattering surface. So CMB photon is emitted, but uh, due to the dark matter distributions between last scattering surface and us, CMB photon is uh, lensed, so the position is shifted, and this shift is also determined by phi plus psi. So we have all these three measurements measuring phi plus psi. Okay. And why one final very important observation is the less shift distortions. So if you observe galaxies and the galaxies have peculiar velocities, they are moving. 
And of course, you measure the clustering of galaxies in, not in the real space, but using redshift. And using redshift, you cannot uh, distinguish between the expansion of the universe and the velocities of galaxies. So let's imagine you have a one-dimensional distribution in a real space, but the galaxies are moving. So this means that in the real, uh, real space, this is the distribution in the thin line. But if you measure this clustering in a less space, the position of the galaxies appears to be here and appears to be here. So this enhances the clustering. So this is known as the uh, recif distortions, and this is determined by the velocity of the galaxies. So this uh, density in the recif space that we measure in the galaxy survey is determined not only by density, but also the velocity. Again, there is no assumption about gravity here. The only assumption is that the velocity of galaxies is the same as velocity of dark matter. That's the assumption. So I would really use theta to theta m. So I assume galaxy velocity is the same as dark matter. This may be not the case if there is interactions between baryons and dark, uh, dark energy and CDM. But this is the assumption. So if galaxies velocity is the same as dark matter, so you are measuring the uh, dark matter velocity. And then you can write down the clustering in the left shift in this way. So mu is the angle between your line of sight and k, because this happens only along the line of sight. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So I assume that galaxies are moving because dark matter is moving. And I assume that the motion of galaxies are determined by the peculiar velocity of dark matter. That's the assumption here. So this applies only for large scales. So on large scales, everything follows the dark matter uh, peculiar velocities. On smaller scales, it's not the case. So you have to worry about baryon physics and things like that. So the velocities of clusters, for example, is not necessarily the same as the velocity of dark matter. Yeah, yeah, so this is really a large scale. So we can ignore all the finger of God effect. So I do not assume anything about, so I assume baryons and dark matters and galaxies' velocities are all the same. That's the assumption. And this may not be the case if you have interacting dark energy. Okay? So the point is that then you can change this theta to delta using this continuity equation. So that's the assumption. If you have this equation, this is related to this gross function I mentioned. So recessive distortion is a way to measure gross rate, but remember that I'm using this equation. So this is the assumption that continuity equation falls. Okay, so the rest of my lecture, let's look at the observational test that you can do. So let's start from background. The simplest thing is to parameterize, right? So the dark energy equation state, the popular one is to Terra expand around A equals one. So this is the parameterization I already showed. So W naught and W A. So W A is describing the changing of equation of state. So now we have a very good uh, paper by Planck uh, last year summarizing all the uh, current status. So I try to uh, show the current status of the observational constraint. So this figure shows that how good this parameterization is. So there are many lines, but just look at these two examples. So this is a two examples of quintessence model with some specific potential. And you can reproduce the equation of state dynamics, the time dependence using this parameterization very well. And then this is a constraint from Planck. So BSH uh, means that this is the background observations like supernovae, and so using that, you get this constraint. So WA, W0, 
is consistent with lambda CDM. But you see that the errors are quite large. So in fact, the errors on WA is huge. So it's order one. So this is the current status. And also you see this degeneracy I talked about. Because fat matters is basically the sum. So there's always a degeneracy along this line. And you cannot break. And other observations, you can also use weak lensing because weak lensing contains some geometrical factor which is affected by W. And also you can use RS, RSD, recessive distortions. And again, error bars are large. And they are not that consistent. I will come back to this. But by combining this, uh, you see that the lambda CDM is still consistent. But remember that the constraints are not that strong at the moment. So let's see. OK, yeah, let's do that. So one thing we may want to do is to try to constrain this function in a model independent way. So the problem of parameterization is that the result you get will really depend on how you parameterize. So in order to avoid this, what you can do is to basically make bins in Z, so let's shift, and treat W in each bin as an independent parameter. So you want to deconstruct some function of W of Z. So what you can do is to make many bins, and then you say W is uh, like this, and try to constrain W in each received bins. However, this is uh, not a very good idea because if you compute the errors on this parameter, so this W bar is the best fit parameter in each bin, and you compute the errors, and you find that the errors are in this bin, so you have errors. And errors here and errors here are very correlated. So this means that it's very difficult to assess how significant the deviations from lambda CDM is just looking at each bin. So this is expressed by this LM matrix called covariant matrix. And this covariant matrix is highly non-diagonal. So meaning that errors here and errors here are highly correlated. So what you can do is just a linear algebra. So you just decombine your this WI in a clever way so that the new parameters errors are uncorrelated. So this is known as the principal component analysis. So basically you want to diagonalize this error matrix. And if you find the eigenmode, you expand this function, not this uh, step function. You just expand using this new basis. And the alpha is just a linear combination of all these parameters. So it's just a clever trick to rearrange your parameters so that you can have a new parameter and errors on these new parameters are uncorrelated. So this is, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So. The question is uh, whether this depends on the size of bin. And if you have enough eigenmode, it will not depend on the size of the bins. That's a good point. I mean, it, at this point, everything depends on the size of the bin. But once you go to this basis, you can remove this uh, size dependence. To do that, of course, you need uh, quite a huge number of well-defined, well-measured eigenmode but eventually it will be independent of the bin size. So just look at the example. So using this technique, basically what you can do is to, you can reconstruct W of Z. So this is one way, not using the parameter. So this is the uh, eigenmode. So this is the combination of W in each bin. So how you combine different uh, dependence of this W. However, there is one caution. So I said this is independent of uh, the parameterizations, but in fact, you cannot escape from theory. The reason is that from observations, you want to measure this function. 
However, you cannot measure all of these functions. The errors become larger and larger if we increase this number. For example, this is the example. This is basically the, uh, how well you can measure and how many this function you can measure. So you can measure first three this function very well. So, so large number here means that the errors are small. Okay? So you can measure these three, so one, two, three mode very well. But then the errors become huge. And what you might want to do is to say that, yeah, you cannot measure all these modes and set the amplitude of all these modes zero. But this is a very bad idea because saying that the amplitude of all these modes are zero means that you measured all these modes in a very precise way, the amplitude of zero with no errors. Okay? So this introduced a bias. So what you have to do is to put some theoretical ex expectations how these not well measured mode behave from theory. Because observations do not tell us about this mode. So you have to put theoretical prior. So just a caution, if you see model independent reconstruction of W, there is a theory, theory always hidden. So you have to always check. But this is better than parameterisa parameterization because to some extent you can remove the dependence on the parameter. So I will come back to this probably next uh, lecture. So another way is to use theory. So if you remember, the equation of state can be parameterized in the scalar field theory in this way. This is a slow roll parameter. This is the density parameter. So why not use this form? So this was done by Planck paper. But they don't want to basically look at huge number of potentials. What they did is to define two parameters. So one is the parameterization of this epsilon phi. So this epsilon s is this parameter when dark matter density and dark energy densities are the same. So this is just a definition to parameterize this. And you have to parameterize this omega phi. The another parameter is this combination at early times. So this is epsilon s, this is epsilon infinity, and this is lambda CDM, so zero. Okay. And if you have a potential, you can predict the, uh, these parameters have for given potentials. And you can put the observational constraint. And this parameter, epsilon infinity, basically measures the importance of dark energy at early times. Okay, so this is the limit where uh, A goes to zero at early times. So if dark energy is very important even at early times, omega F is large, so epsilon phi is large. So this is uh, basically the uh, freezing model. So at early times, uh, so, uh, the uh, dark energy is important, like an inverse of phi, uh, appears here, so dark energy density is large at early times, and this is already excluded. And then there are a bunch of the scalar field potentials. So finally, let's look at the structure formation. So how we use the structure formation. So we are talking about just the distance. So this is a moving distance, and in the smooth dark energy, if you change the equation of state, so this is a simple example of changing constant equation of state, so this is lambda CDM, this is say W is minus 0 0.7. And as I said, the nature of lambda CDM and smooth dark energy is that once you fix background, everything is fixed. So this is the gross rate divided by A, so this is one for no lambda, you have lambda CDM, and this is smooth, smooth dark energy with W minus 0 0.7. The point is that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence, so if you measure this, you predict structure formation. Okay? So this is a prediction of lambda CDM and smooth dark energy. And this changes if you have a clustering. So this is a, a Predictions for cross-linked dark energy or modified gravity. So 
the same, you, let's say you have the background with the equation of state minus 0 0.7, you have two models, smooth dark energy and clustering dark energy or modified gravity. You cannot distinguish each between the two just using background. It's the same. However, if you look at the structure formation, you have additional contribution from uh, clustering of dark energy. This changes how structure grows. Okay. So these two models, you cannot distinguish using just background, but looking at structure, you now see the difference. Okay. So this is smooth dark energy. Now you can break the degeneracy. So that's the reason why we want to combine the measurement from background and the measurement from structure formation. So in this way, you can distinguish between the smooth dark energy lambda CDM from this more complicated clustering dark energy modified gravity. This is a very good example of how this shows up. Okay. So let's imagine that our universe is described by clustering dark energy or modified gravity. Okay. You are living in a universe where dark energy clusters. Of course, you don't want to trust this, so you want to try to fit your data using this simple parameterizations. So now you use background observations, supernovae and CMB, and you get constraint. So now you use a combination of supernovae and weak lensing, so weak lensing measures the structures. You get a very different, uh, so, sorry, this is using CMB, but point is that having weak lensing, you get a very different constraint. Why? That's because of this difference, right? So you, your universe is described by this blue line, and you try to fit this using smooth dark energy, so you can do that in the background, but if you want to try to fit this for weak lensing, you have to have a different equation of state. So there is an inconsistency between background and structure formation. So if you see this kind of constraint, this indicates that dark energy is not as simple as you think. So dark energy should have some kind of clustering to see this inconsistency. So this is the thing you can do. So you can combine structure formation and the background you can test the nature of dark energy. So this is the final slide. So how then you distinguish between clustering dark energy and modified gravity? So what I said is that using structure formation, you can distinguish between smooth dark energy and clustering dark energy. But clustering dark energy and modified gravity look the same. So let's remember that the the difference between clustering dark energy and modified gravity in general is that you have a large anisotropic stress. So remember that large anisotropic stress means that phi is not the same as psi. So remember, using weak lensing, you can measure phi plus psi, and in GR, this is the same as psi, because phi is the same as psi. But if you have anisotropic stress, phi plus psi is not the same as psi. So if you remember, we have two kind of measurement. One is to use the lensing potential, like weak lensing, CMB lensing, ISW. All, are, all of these are sensitive to phi plus psi. But the peculiar velocities are determined by only by psi. So this means that, so this is the case, so peculiar velocities are determined by psi. So if phi plus psi is different from psi, this means that there is a difference between weak lensing and peculiar velocities. So this is another step. Within the structure formation, combining a different way to measure structure formation, you can distinguish between crossing dark energy and modified gravity. For example, you can construct an estimator comparing phi plus psi to theta. So you can measure this from weak lensing, you can measure this from peculiar velocities. And if this relation is not false, then you can see some inconsistency. And this uh, was applied to the real data. So this must be the prediction from lambda CDM. For example, F of R predicts this. 
As you see, the data points are quite uh, scattered. The error bars are very large. So at the moment, we cannot say anything about this test. But uh, in the next lecture, I will sh show that in the future, this kind of test uh, becomes realistic. Okay. Okay. So I think it's time. So I finish uh, my lecture here. So the important thing is that it's very important to look at many different proofs of dark energy, but you have to remember what the assumptions you make to make these observations. Okay.